This is Quantum Mechanics 5, The Schrodinger Equation. Welcome. The Schrodinger Equation, published in 1926 by Erwin Schrodinger, is practically synonymous with quantum mechanics. It is the primary key which unlocks the secrets of the atom and of chemistry, and which describes what Schrodinger called an undulatory theory of the mechanics of atoms and molecules. Now, since this is a video about an equation, it will necessarily contain some math. But, hopefully, you'll find the emphasis is on motivation and illustration of physical concepts. Schrodinger started with de Broglie's hypothesis that electrons are associated with waves having wavelength equal to Planck's constant over electron momentum. Recall from the previous video that this explained the discrete energy levels of the Bohr model of hydrogen as simply the requirement that the length of an orbit equal an integer number of wavelengths. Schrodinger sought the general equation governing these waves, a wave equation of the electron. To understand how he arrived at this, we first need to talk about wave equations in general. Wave equations describe the behavior of fields. A field, which, following Schrodinger, will denote by Greek letter psi, is simply some quantity which exists at all points of a space. An example is the field of Earth's surface temperature. At any point on Earth, this field's value is simply the temperature at that point. Atmospheric pressure defines another field, as does ground elevation. For any field, physics seeks an equation to describe its behavior. In the great majority of cases, nature, quote, wants a field to be as uniform as possible. Usually this means that in equilibrium, the field is uniformly constant everywhere. For example, if we dip a wire rectangle in soapy water, the resulting soap bubble will be, neglecting gravity, uniformly flat. The field of soap bubble elevation will be constant. But what if the field can't be constant? What then would as uniform as possible mean? Suppose we bend our wire rectangle into a curve. Rather than trying to stay flat, the soap film will relax into some smoothly curved shape. What determines this equilibrium shape? The answer is that the field value at each point equals the average of the neighboring values. This is what as uniform as possible means in general. Imagine the field psi at some point in three-dimensional space and a small sphere of radius A surrounding that point. Call the average field value on the sphere psi average. Then equilibrium simply requires that psi equals psi average. This is so common in physics that we have a special symbol in operation called the Laplacian that measures the difference between psi average and psi. The Laplacian is denoted by what looks like a triangle to the power 2, applied to the field of interest. Specifically, for a very small radius a, the Laplacian is basically 6 over a squared times the difference of psi average and psi. In equilibrium, these values are equal, and we have Laplace's equation, which simply tells us that there is no difference between a field value and the average of its neighbors. But what if we disturb the equilibrium of a field? Say we use our finger to make an indentation in an initially flat, stretched membrane. We expect that the indented part will feel a force pulling it upward. Neighboring points will feel a corresponding force pulling them downward. As those points move in an attempt to re-establish equilibrium, they will disturb the equilibrium of yet other points, which in turn will move in response. The result is a wave which propagates away from the initial disturbance out to infinity, assuming our membrane is of infinite extent. If instead the membrane has a boundary, the wave will be reflected there and travel until it's reflected a second time, and a third time, and on and on. Unless energy is removed from the membrane, these fluctuations will continue indefinitely. Now, if we look at the displacement of a single point on the membrane over time, we find a fairly complicated curve. The equation that tells us how to predict this curve is called the wave equation. To develop the wave equation, we'll consider one-dimensional waves of balls connected by springs. In the situation shown here, the middle ball is pulled by two springs, and the net force would be zero if the ball were at the center of the line connecting its neighbors. 
This is simply the condition that its position is the average of its neighbors. The average position is higher than the actual position, so in this case the Laplacian is positive. We write that the acceleration of the ball is proportional to the Laplacian, that is, proportional to the difference of the equilibrium position and the actual position. We denote acceleration with two dots, and the constant of proportionality turns out to be the square of the wave velocity, c, the speed of light, or of sound, or of whatever it is we're describing. If we plot the ball's position, which is our field value, through time we get some curve. At a particular time, we're at some point on the curve, and we can draw a line through the curve at this point. This is the velocity, or the slope of the field in time, and we denote this with a single dot. We can also draw a circle through the curve at this point, and this is related to the acceleration, or the curvature of the field in time, that we denote with two dots. This curvature is also the slope of the slope of the field. So the wave equation tells us that when the field value at a point is not in equilibrium with its neighbors, the plot of that field value versus time will have a corresponding curvature. The greater the disequilibrium, the greater the curvature. If the field value is less than the equilibrium value, the curvature will be upward, as shown in this figure. Conversely, if the field value were greater than the equilibrium value, then the curvature would be downward. Starting with some initial condition, knowing this curvature at every point allows us to calculate the field at all future times. Now, in general, this process is pretty complicated. But it's possible to find special waves that vary in a relatively simple manner, such that the displacement at every point is a uniform sine wave, defining a single definite frequency. In quantum mechanics, frequency is related to energy, so we expect that such waves will turn out to be very important. If the field varies as sine of t, and at every point we plot the field slope, we get another curve, which is the cosine of t. Plotting the slope of the cosine produces minus the sine of t. So for our purposes, if the field, or position, is sine of t, the slope, or velocity, is cosine of t, and the curvature, or acceleration, is minus the sine of t. Now imagine we make our sine wave oscillate faster. We write the field as sine 2 pi nu t, where nu is the frequency of oscillation. Since this compresses our curve horizontally, the slopes will increase, and our slope function will have a larger amplitude. It's 2 pi nu times the cosine of 2 pi nu t. Likewise, the curvature has an even larger amplitude. It's minus quantity 2 pi nu squared times sine of 2 pi nu t. This is minus quantity 2 pi nu squared times the field itself. For waves with this special single frequency behavior, the wave equation has a special form. Our general wave equation is time curvature of the field equals wave speed squared times the Laplacian of the field. For the single frequency case, the curvature is just minus quantity 2 pi nu squared times the field. If we divide by c squared and use the relation between wave speed, wavelength, and frequency, the wave equation becomes the so-called Helmholtz equation. This is the wave equation for a single frequency, and it was well known in Schrodinger's time, having been used to describe light, radio, sound, and water waves. Now, finally, we're ready to develop the Schrodinger equation. Recall de Broglie's hypothesis for the relation between electron momentum and wavelength, the same relation we have for photons, p equals Planck's constant over wavelength. From this, 1 over lambda equals p over h, and plugging that into the Helmholtz equation gives us the result shown here. Now momentum, p, squared equals mv squared, and we can write this as 2m times 1 half m v squared. This second quantity is just the kinetic energy of the electron, k, so we have p squared equals 2m k. Since the total energy of an electron is its kinetic energy plus its potential energy, we can write the kinetic energy as the total energy E minus the potential energy V. Plugging 2m times E minus V in for P squared 
we obtain the Schrodinger equation for a single frequency in essentially the form Schrodinger presented it in 1926. Incredibly, that's basically all there is to it. Since that time, people have found it useful to multiply through by h bar squared over 2m, where, recall, h bar is h over 2 pi, and rearrange to get the following form. Minus h bar squared over 2m times the Laplacian of the field plus the potential energy times the field equals the total energy times the field. What's attractive about this form is that it corresponds to the classical equation kinetic energy plus potential energy equals total energy. We see that in quantum mechanics, the Laplacian, the measure of the disequilibrium of the field associated with an electron, corresponds to the electron's kinetic energy. In the nearly 90 years since it was first presented, this form of Schrodinger's equation has proven to be one of the most consequential equations in all of physics. Nearly any scientific inquiry or technological application at the atomic scale must apply it at some level. Still, this form of the Schrodinger equation, as the Helmholtz equation from which we obtained it, is limited to single frequency fields corresponding to Bohr stationary states. We want to find the general form of the equation. To start, for a frequency nu, Planck's relation gives the energy as h nu. So let's write e psi equals h nu psi. Now we've seen that if the field varies as sine 2 pi nu t, the slope in time is 2 pi nu times cosine 2 pi nu t. That factor of nu means that if we multiply by h bar, the 2 pi cancels and leaves us with h nu. So h bar times psi dot equals e times the cosine. This is almost what we're looking for, namely e times psi, but we have a cosine instead of a sine. We know that the curvature gives us a sine, but it also gives us a nu squared, which would produce a factor of e squared, and that's not what we're looking for. Instead, it seems that in general, the e psi term should be replaced by something involving the field's slope and time, but the nuts and bolts don't quite mesh yet. The way the nuts and bolts were put together struck many physicists, including Schrodinger, as rather bizarre and a bit unsettling. It was necessary to make use of the so-called imaginary unit, i. Mathematicians invented i in order to be able to write i squared equals minus 1, or i equals the square root of minus 1. The square of any real number cannot be negative, so i is an imaginary number. Now that's fine for abstract math, but it would be shocking if a theory of physical reality employed an imaginary number. Yet that is what the general form of Schrodinger's equation does. Assume the field has a real part, sine 2 pi nu t, plus an imaginary part, i cosine 2 pi nu t. The field's slope in time, psi dot, is then 2 pi nu times the cosine, minus i 2 pi nu times the sine. Multiply this by i times h bar. The two pi's cancel, h times nu is energy e, and minus i squared is minus minus 1 equals 1. The resulting real part is e times the sine, and the imaginary part is i times e times the cosine. So i h bar psi dot equals e psi. Now we can replace e psi in the single frequency Schrodinger equation by i h bar psi dot to get the general Schrodinger equation shown here. Our mathematical description of physical reality employs unreal imaginary numbers. Incredible. Now the steps we just took might seem like they would only work for a field oscillating at a single frequency nu. So how is this a more general equation, you might ask? The key is that for the first form of the Schrodinger equation, you need to specify the energy before you solve the equation. This necessarily limits you to a solution at the single frequency corresponding to the energy E, if indeed you're able to find a solution at all. In the second form, the frequency is extracted by the slope operation, so you don't need to put it into the equation at the start. 
Moreover, suppose you have two fields oscillating at different frequencies and you add them together to get a new field. The slope term i h bar psi dot operates on the two components separately and when you plug all of this into the general Schrodinger equation, it breaks up into two independent single frequency equations. This idea can be extended to the sum of any number of components. And using the theory of Fourier discussed in a previous video, this means that the second form of Schrodinger's equation is truly general, applying to any conceivable field. So we have two forms of the Schrodinger equation. The form for the general case is used when we need to describe dynamic situations, such as an electron traveling through the double slit experiment. The single frequency form is used to calculate the energy levels of atoms and the chemical bonds in molecules. In the next part, we'll look at animations of Schrodinger equation solutions to get some idea of what all this math actually says about how the world works at atomic scales. In part A, we develop the Schrodinger equation. In this video, we want to visualize some of its solutions to try and figure out what it actually predicts. We let the computer numerically solve the general form in various two-dimensional situations. The basic idea is that if we know the wave function psi at some time, the equation gives us its slope, which we can follow to find the wave function a short time in the future. We repeat this process for as long as desired. Remember from part A that the wave function, bizarrely, has both a real part and an imaginary part. Our animations will be of the sum of the squares of these. In a classical theory, this would represent a wave intensity, like the intensity of light. In quantum mechanics, it turns out to represent the probability of finding an electron at some point in space. We begin with one of the simplest situations, the so-called particle-in-a-box scenario. We have a square box and we place an electron at its center. The walls are impenetrable, so the wave function is zero outside the box. Inside, the potential energy is zero, meaning no forces act on the electron. Classically, we would expect to be able to place a particle at rest and have it stay put. But under wave-particle duality, we know the uncertainty principle will apply. If the electron's position is uncertain to delta x, its momentum will be uncertain to delta p, which is no smaller than Planck's constant over delta x. Therefore, the electron cannot be perfectly at rest at a precise location. Let's look at the classical picture of an electron at the box's center. We'll represent momentum uncertainty by showing several copies of the electron moving with small velocity in different directions. The result is a cloud of particles that slowly expands. Now let's look at the prediction of the Schrodinger equation. We'll represent the wave function probability as the color-coded height of a surface, viewed from directly above. To show small details, we'll greatly amplify the heights and chop off the large parts, which then appear white in our top view. So the white area is where the probability is very large, and the dark blue area has zero probability. We start with a broad wave function, meaning we don't constrain the electron location very tightly. This large uncertainty in position will produce a small uncertainty in momentum. So as the wave function evolves according to the Schrodinger equation, it slowly expands. Eventually it starts interacting with the walls, modifying its initially circular shape. Now suppose we tightly constrain the initial location of the electron. This should produce a large momentum uncertainty and classically we'd see a rapidly expanding group of particles that would quickly bounce off the walls. For the quantum mechanical case, we start with a narrow wave function. It rapidly spreads, reflects from the box, and then produces a kaleidoscopic sequence of interference patterns. Now the obvious question is, what are we looking at here? What do these images physically represent? Schrodinger's proposal was that Quote, material points consist of, or are nothing but, wave systems. Therefore, the wave pattern we are seeing here is an electron. Period. Electrons, indeed all particles, are nothing but matter waves. Furthermore, he proposed that, quote, the wave function physically means and determines a continuous distribution of electricity in space. 
the fluctuations of which determine the radiation by the laws of ordinary electrodynamics. In the next video, we'll see that Schrodinger had good reasons to think this. In fact, he hoped that his equation provided a classical deterministic basis for atomic theory, in which there would be no wave-particle duality and no quantum jumps occurring at random governed only by probabilities. At the same time, he realized that, quote, this extreme conception may be wrong. Indeed, it does not offer as yet the slightest explanation of why only such wave systems seem to be realized in nature as correspond to mass points of definite mass and charge. And this was the objection raised by many other physicists. If the electron is a wave, it should be possible for it to spread out and for us to detect small pieces of it. But all we ever detect, as in the Millikan experiment, are whole electrons. It was Max Born who proposed what has become the standard interpretation of Schrodinger's wave function. The squared magnitude of the wave function represents the probability of finding the electron at some point in space at a given time. What Schrodinger's equation determines is not the behavior of the electron itself, but the evolution of the amplitude of this probability. When we experimentally detect it, the electron appears as a particle at a definite place, and the wave function will have collapsed. In a sense, the wave function represents not an electron, but our knowledge of the state of an electron. Let's mix things up by curving the bottom of our box, or equivalently, using a spring to attach the electron to the middle of the box. Everything is as before, except that the potential is now proportional to the square of the electron's distance from the center of the box. If it moves a small distance, it feels a small force pulling it back towards the center. If it's a large distance, the force is large. This is classically the nature of the force produced by a spring, or by gravity on a particle sliding on a curved surface. The force is always pulling the particle towards the center of the box. In the classical case, a particle released at rest simply oscillates back and forth across the box. If there's some initial range of momenta, the possible paths spread out, but then reconverge on the other side of the box. The greater the range of momenta, the greater the spreading, but the paths always reconverge. Now let's see what Schrodinger's equation predicts for the quantum mechanical case. We start with a broad wave function and we see it behaves more or less like a classical particle, with a bit of spreading and contracting, as we'd expect given the uncertainty principle. For each oscillation, we narrow the initial wave function, and we observe greater spreading. Eventually, the wave function starts interacting with the sides of the box, and wave interference effects start showing up as distortion in its initially round shape. When wave effects become extreme, we've transcended the picture of a classically moving particle. We can see Bohr's correspondence principle manifested in these calculations. At relatively large scales, the behavior predicted by quantum mechanics corresponds to the classical prediction for a particle moving under a force. Even though the classical and quantum theories employ quite different physical concepts and mathematical expressions, at large enough scales they make similar predictions about the behavior of particles. It's only when we push down to very small scales that quantum theory strongly diverges in its predictions and wave-particle duality becomes very apparent. Of course it was behavior at these small scales that motivated the development of the theory in the first place. So quantum mechanics and classical mechanics are not two disjointed unrelated theories. Instead they represent two ends of a continuum if the scale of a system being analyzed is really big, then quantum and classical mechanics give the same predictions. In this case, there's no need for the extra complexity of quantum mechanics, and we can think of this as a purely classical realm. On the other hand, if the scale is really small, then wave-particle duality becomes important, and classical mechanics fails to accurately describe our observations. This is the purely quantum realm, where Schrodinger's equation reigns supreme. The uncertainty principle is what delineates these extremes. If the product of the ranges of position and momentum is much bigger than Planck's constant, then quantum effects are negligible. This is true in the macroscopic world of our day-to-day -day experience. 
If, on the other hand, the product is on the order of Planck's constant, then quantum effects will be very important. Recall from video 4C how Bohr proposed the concept of stationary orbits to explain why atoms have discrete energy levels and don't suffer radiation collapse. De Broglie proposed that these were orbits in which fit a whole number of electron waves. The stationary state concept naturally arises in the solution of the Schrodinger equation without any additional assumptions. We can find certain solutions for which the wave function intensity, the probability distribution for finding the electron at a given place in space, doesn't change with time. As we discussed in Part A, these are the solutions where the electron has a well-defined energy. Here are some of the stationary states for our curved bottom box. This is the lowest energy state. It's the quantum state that most nearly corresponds to the electron being at rest in the middle of the box. The next lowest energy state has two lobes. We can have three lobe and six lobe and so on stationary states where generally the more lobes the higher the energy. Let's look at the two lobe stationary state in a little more detail. This image tells us that if we measure the position of the electron it will most likely be in one of the two reddish regions. But we can't know which one. Likewise, although presumably the electron is oscillating back and forth, we can't know which direction it's traveling in at a given time. In this pure energy state, the electron is equally likely to be on the left as on the right, and equally likely to be traveling left to right as right to left. Following Schrodinger's interpretation of this figure as representing the distribution of electric charge in space, we conclude that there is no movement of charge, hence no radiation is generated. But suppose that at some time we somehow determine that the electron cannot be on the left side of the box. So let's chop off that part of the wave function. Then Schrodinger's equation tells us that the electron, which we now know is somewhere on the right, is moving towards the left. We can see the oscillation. And if this does represent the motion of electric charge, which produces radiation by the laws of classical electrodynamics, then we expect it to radiate away energy until it settles down into a stationary state of lower energy, the one lobe state. This is an example of the way in which Schrodinger thought his equation could bring classical determinism back into atomic physics. However, just as electrons only show up as discrete particles, so too does radiation only show up as discrete photons. Schrodinger's equation was a great triumph indeed, but his classical interpretation of the wave function failed to explain what is actually observed. Instead, it was Born's interpretation of the wave function as a probability amplitude and the corresponding picture of wave-particle duality that was found to be consistent with experimental results. The double-slit experiment is the quintessential demonstration of photon-wave-particle duality. So let's see what Schrodinger's equation predicts for a double-slit experiment performed with electrons. We'll simulate the experiment inside our flat-bottom box. We're using a slightly different color scheme here, where black represents zero amplitude up through blue, green, red, and finally white, which represents large amplitude. We start off with a wave function that is wide in the horizontal dimension and narrow in the vertical dimension. It has an average momentum towards the top of the box. As it moves through the box, we see very little spreading horizontally, but significant spreading vertically, consistent with the demands of the uncertainty principle. Eventually, the wave function hits the upper wall. Now we repeat with a single slit screen in the middle of the box. The wave function is reflected from the screen but passes through the slit and rapidly spreads, fairly uniformly, into the top half of the box. Moving the slit to the right, we get a similar result with the transmitted part of the wave function simply shifted with the slit. Now, with both slits open, we see what looks basically like a composite of the two single slit cases until the two spreading lobes begin to overlap. At that point we see interference fringes forming. These fringes indicate that on average electrons should arrange themselves on the top screen in alternating bands of high and low probability, hence of high and low density. When the experiment is performed remarkably, that is indeed what is observed. Schrodinger's equation provides us with a precise description of the physical world, but it's a description in terms of the probabilities of observing non-deterministic physical events.
It seems that we must heed the words of Niels Bohr. It is wrong to think that the task of physics is to find out how nature is. Physics concerns what we can say about nature. And clearly, there seem to be very fundamental limits to what it is we are able to say about nature.